link it, it can do a presentation. All right, I will I will use that on some slides. Um, welcome to lecture two on our corporate finance course, where our subject is bond and stock valuation. Sometimes you hear this uh, subject referred to as the stock and the bond markets. We want to talk about the markets. Uh, but what is more important for our purposes in this course, which is about corporate finance, is how these markets value these particular financial assets. In lecture one, we talked about uh, the role of the financial manager. And we talked about how the financial manager is an intermediary, if you would, between the financial markets and the uh, real operations of the business. So we, as financial managers, we look to these markets for information. Another concept, another thing we talked about last uh, lecture. Uh, we, we look for information out of these markets. What are bonds worth? What are stocks worth? Their valuation. We, we use that information, how stocks and bonds are being valued in the market, in order to assess our performance, in order to assess the value of the real assets. So I emphasize that point, that we're here tonight to talk about uh, stock valuation or bond valuation. We're not here to talk about stock trading, stock picking, bond trading, or uh, leveraged uh, assets and uh, some of the more esoteric uh, segments of, uh, of these markets that you might have read about in the, the news. We're not here to make you hedge fund managers uh, that are going to go out and, and raise a bunch of capital and start trading stocks or trading commodities or, or what have you. We, the, the course is, our objective is for you to understand the role of the financial manager or perhaps become a financial manager in a corporation yourself. And so in that role, you will need to look to the financial markets. You'll need to study the bond and stock markets for this information, this valuation information uh, that we want to uh, get out of it. And so I emphasize that point. Uh, we're not here to become stock traders, bond traders. Uh, there, there are a lot of aspects uh, to that uh, business. There are a lot more issues to cover. Uh, the principles that we might study here are useful to bond traders, to hedge fund managers, uh, but they're, they're not our purpose. They're not our objective. Our objective remains, as a financial manager, to be part of the strategic team that buys real assets for the business and creates value for the shareholders. As part of that role, we need to, however, understand the financial markets and how they value assets. And so that's uh, our purpose. Stock and bond valuation. All right, let's start with the bond market. And uh, discuss first a, a little background of the bar bond market. Uh, the bond market uh, worldwide uh, last estimate I saw was about $82 trillion worth of value in financial assets worldwide. And uh, uh, roughly some uh, 30 or uh, 35 trillion uh, of that 82 worldwide in the United States. Uh, so the first thing to know about the bond market is the biggest one is located in the United States. The most bond activity, the highest valuation in the bond market happens in of the United States markets. Now that is uh, an important thing to keep in mind uh, that uh, the bond markets, ac accessing the public debt markets, if you would, is most popular in the United States. When firms, when corporations use, uh, use debt in their capital structures outside the United States, they rely more so on private debt markets, i.e., the banks, uh, bank lending. So, $82 trillion market, uh, the uh, biggest use of that 
though in the United States, particularly by corporations. So if worldwide corporations aren't big users of the public debt market, who is? The answer is governments. Uh, the, most, uh, the biggest issuer worldwide in this $82 trillion is, uh, is, is or are governments. And the biggest issuer in the world is the U.S. Treasury. The U.S. Treasury has outstanding today roughly $11.5 trillion worth of debt securities, bonds. Uh, they are the biggest player. That makes up about a third of all the U.S. market. And, uh, and then uh, almost, uh, I call it one-seventh, one-eighth of, of the entire global market. So the U.S. Treasury is a big player uh, in this market. It's the primary issuer. Uh, we bring up U.S. Treasuries because uh, they, as the biggest player, as the most liquid bond market in the world, uh, these assets, these financial assets, serve as benchmarks. Uh, they serve as a benchmark interest rate to which almost all other securities are, uh, are judged, are weighted against. If you're looking at government or corporate uh, debt in Europe, uh, they're, they're more often compared to the German bonds, uh, but also some, but even sometimes they're uh, compared or, or rated against uh, U.S. Treasuries. Uh, but the ultimate benchmark interest rate uh, in uh, the financial markets today is or comes from uh, U.S. Treasuries. Other issuers in uh, the uh, United States. Uh, fall into four general categories. So we have the first category being the U.S. Treasury, the second being corporate bond issuance, and so this would be uh, debt of Coca-Cola or debt of Caterpillar or uh, debt of Monsanto, uh, these, uh, the agricultural company. Uh, this would be this would also include debt issued uh, by the likes of Northwest Nazarene University. Uh, so this will include. Uh, the even not uh, debt that isn't widely traded. Uh, but this makes up about 24% uh, of the U.S. market is uh, corporate debt issuance. The third uh, big category uh, comes from uh, our mortgage-related debt. And uh, the big issuers here are, or is, again, the United States government uh, through uh, the uh, Entities, uh, Fannie Mae, uh, Freddie Mac, and the uh, Federal Housing Administration. These institutions, which are government-run today, uh, they haven't always been, but uh, these are government-run in institutions, federal government-run in institutions, that buy mortgage debt off of banks. So you and I, we go and we take out a mortgage to buy our house. Uh, then more often than not, much more often than not, the banker doesn't keep the mortgage. Uh, the banker sells that debt to somebody else, uh, takes a little bit of a spread. Uh, they sell it to somebody else for uh, more than they, it, it cost uh, them. So they make a little bit of profit, and then they go do it again, make another mortgage loan to somebody else. And so these, uh, these bonds today make up about 21% of the U.S. Uh, bond market. So this is a... This is a big area of bond markets today. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, mortgage-backed uh, securities. Uh, you may have read in the news or been following the news of the Federal Reserve and the quantitative easing program. The quantitative easing program today includes the purchase roughly of about $30 billion every month in these same mortgage-backed securities. And so that they are making an active market uh, in this area. And then the fourth uh, area is uh, going to be a topic for discussion tonight uh, based on a Wall Street Journal article, and that is uh, municipals or municipal bonds. And these are, again, government-backed securities, uh, but they differ in a number of uh, respects. These are bonds that are issued by non-federal government agencies, so city governments, county governments, state governments, uh, and they're all lumped under this category uh, called uh, municipal. Uh, this, uh, today in the U.S., this makes up about 10% uh, of the corporate market. And then uh, the remaining, if you 
if you want to add up to 100, about uh, 10 or a little more percent. Various other uh, government agencies, uh, various other types of corporate debt uh, that uh, we don't study in this class. But if you, if you go on and study finance, you'll look at things like asset-backed securities and uh, inventory uh, sales, uh, car loans, uh, leasing packages that are sold out on bonds and so forth, uh, make up the remaining category. So that's a picture of the bond market, if you would. Uh, it's made up of these guys, and we want to talk about each of these issuers and uh, what, how they differ. What are the different characteristics among these four different groups? Uh, but let's start by uh, defining simply a bond. And uh, as, you, uh, as you look in, uh, at different uh, textbook writers, or you look across the web at different analysts, uh, the definitions vary uh, a little bit. Uh, but uh, the, the terminology I like to use is that it's a debt security. And uh, that definition has two parts. And so it's a debt. So it's a, it's, a, it's a loan. It's a borrowing and so forth. Uh, but it's also a security, meaning that the, that loan is negotiable. I can buy and sell it off to somebody else. Some debts are not. You, you, you might borrow some money uh, from somebody with the agreement that you only pay them back. If they want uh, their money back, they've got to come to you. If they want to get their cash out of this investment, they have to come to you. That would be a non-negotiable debt instrument. Bonds will always be, as for our purposes, our discussion tonight, negotiable, meaning they're securities. It's a financial asset that can be bought and sold in a market. Now, the second uh, key characteristic is that they'll have some coupon uh, payment. That coupon payment might be periodic. It, it might be all at once. But it's some stated interest. So when a bond has a coupon, it we mean that it has some periodic interest that is paid to the bond holder, the actual lender, at some previously fixed or contracted rate. All right, it's, a, it's got a coupon with it. That terminology comes from back in the day when these financial assets were actually traded as pieces of paper. Your contract was written out. You had a bond certificate. You might have seen pictures of them before. They look like stock certificates, uh, but they, they actually refer to a debt instrument. And at the bottom of that piece of paper were these little regular interest payments. So the borrower had agreed to pay interest on particular dates, and those were written at the bottom of the contract. And so the bond holder, the lender, in order to get their interest, had to clip the coupon and send it in. And usually they would send it to their bank uh, that did it, uh, collected the interest on their behalf. But the borrower didn't have to pay the interest if you didn't send in the coupon. So that was uh, how we got the terminology uh, coupon. And we uh, uh, almost all bonds issued today are done so electronically, and there's no actual paper transactions. You just you sign up for an account, and the account holds uh, the debt instrument uh, for you. So that that's the terminology. That's my definition uh, of a bond. It's going to have it's going to be negotiable. It's a loan that's negotiable. It can be traded in markets, and it's going to have some fixed or contracted rate of interest that we call the coupon uh, payment. Uh, anything else is going to be a loan, uh, and, and it's going to be different uh, than a bond. Okay, let's talk about that definition then in these four uh, categories. All right, beginning with the U.S. Treasury, that it's the largest. I mentioned it's the benchmark. Uh, it's uh, historically it was quoted in uh, 30 seconds, uh, but now it's uh, done in decimal form, and it's usually priced or discussed as a percent of face value. So if the, uh, if the bond is selling at face value, whatever the original amount of the debt was, then I say it's selling at 100. It's selling at 100% of face value. If the bond is, is instead priced in the secondary market, in this negotiable market, uh, then I say it's selling at 102 or 110. If it's uh, selling at a discount, I call it 98, 90. and then we'll we'll take that to a decimal. So we might have 98 
98.11, we might have 98.2. Uh, we'll look at uh, some examples of that uh, in a little bit. Treasury securities uh, regularly pay semi-annually. The coupon is semi-annual. In uh, Europe and many other countries, uh, it's only annual. It's, uh, it's been, a, tr I guess, a tradition historically. Uh, the uh, U.S. government has, has gone with uh, semi-annual payments. Corporate debt in the United States uh, follows a similar pattern. And then finally, which will be important later, this is state or local tax free. So the interest that you earn on U.S. Treasuries cannot be taxed by your state or your city if they, if they have income taxes. That is because of the Constitution. States can't tax what the federal government does. Federal government can't tax what states do. All right, corporate bonds. Go over here. Again, usually semi-annual payments. But then they can have different backings. Uh, so uh, different indemnitures, to, to use another term. The backing might be called what, uh, what we say is general obligation bonds. Or they might be senior bonds. Or they might be asset backed, like I talked about uh, before. Uh, they might be uh, subordinated bonds. I don't even know how to spell that. The point is not to remember all that. It just, the corporate bonds can be structured or written with any clauses that the bond issuers or and the bond buyers would like to have. So I can, as a corporation, I can issue debt. And then I can later on issue some other that is subordinated to the first one. Bonds are just contracts. You can write into the contract anything you want. We often call those covenants. The bond contract might say that the uh, if the company ever misses an interest payment, it's not allowed to pay any more dividends to the owner, for example. That might be a covenant. The bond, co uh, might, uh, so the bond contract might say that if the corporation buys another corporation, they have to pay off the debt holders first. Uh, that might be a covenant uh, in the loan. Corporate bonds, for that reason, vary dramatically. Treasury bonds tend to be very standard. It's always the U.S. Treasury, and it's always a general obligations of the U.S. Treasury. Corporate bonds vary by the corporation. That's important to keep in mind as when you might be uh, issuing uh, corporate debt. Okay, mortgage-related are, hence the name, always backed by some mortgage, or more likely, a pool of mortgages. But again, if you've followed the news over the last five years, you might know that uh, there's been some very interesting structures in some of these mortgage-backed securities, and a number of financial institutions, like Lehman Brothers and some others, I got into big trouble investing in those same bonds. So these are contracts again. And so they can be uh, backed uh, by any number of different types of mortgages. Uh, they can be uh, very uh, diversified over many different uh, mortgage locations, or they can be very specific uh, to a particular geographical area or a particular type of borrower. So they are just contracts. But they always have some home loan or some building loan against the security. That, that will be the only common characteristic. And then finally, we got US, uh, we got municipals, which follow the characteristics of corporates, uh, except for they are federal tax free. And for some investor classes, this can be very important. If I'm a wealthy individual and I've built up a lot of, uh, a lot of wealth, and I have a lot of capital, I might want to choose municipal securities so that the earnings off that capital, I don't pay any uh, taxes on. I don't pay any federal taxes in particular. 
the current uh, top tax bracket in the United States is roughly 40%. If you add on the average state tax, wealthy individuals in this country are paying 45% income tax. So you can see the advantage just right there, it, it's almost double advantage from a municipal bond. I'm saving half the taxes that I might as well might have paid otherwise. So municipal bonds are are often purchased by uh, more wealthy uh, individuals because of that federal tax-free benefit. If I am also an Idaho resident and I buy an Idaho municipal bond, I guess both the, the federal tax benefit and the state and local. I, we often say that's double tax-free. So a lot of advantages to, to the wealth. But that market is still not all that big. It only makes up 10% uh, of of the uh, of the uh, the total U.S. bond market. The next thing to know about the bond market is the idea of bond ratings. We we first talked about the four categories. Uh, in the bond market, there's a heavy reliance on. The, what are called the credit rating agencies. If you, uh, if you study the financial crisis of 2007-2009, you'll hear a lot about uh, these, three ra these three rating agencies. Uh, they, they played a role uh, in, in that crisis. Uh, we don't have time to talk about it, but uh, they did have uh, a role in that, and so they're, they're undergoing a, a bit of a transformation now. So where did that role come from? Well, it came from actually a law uh, that said that certain pension funds could only buy bonds that had certain ratings. Um, and so by, by enacting that law, the US government forced people to uh, buy the services of these rating agencies. And the law actually specified three companies. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, following the financial crisis now, these laws are being reformed and adjusted. They haven't really changed much yet, uh, but they're under review, you might say. So the law uh, put in place uh, this, this rating uh, guidelines from uh, Moody's, uh, the company's called Moody's Analytic, uh, Standard & Poor's, uh, that's a company you might be familiar with, the Standard & Poor's 500 uh, index, same company. And then a company called Fitch, that's not the, I think it's Fitch and Company is the, the full name. Uh, these three uh, companies, uh, their, bond, their job is, very, is just analytical. They, just, they write reports. It's, it's purely a service business. And the reports they write are, uh, have one fundamental objective. Uh, they have other services they uh, provide. But these credit reports, are designed to determine the default risk in a bond. That's their main objective. What's the likelihood that the company won't pay? That's what we mean by the word default. What, they might miss a coupon payment, or they might not return the principal that you lent to them. That's the job of the credit agencies. And they, they write these reports and assess. And they play an important role in this market, again, because the federal government said that pension funds and, in some cases, uh, state governments required insurance companies to only buy bonds that had certain ratings from these three companies. And so these insurance companies that buy a lot of bonds, these pension funds that invest a lot of their, uh, their pensioners' money into bonds, were required to use these services. And so that's how they started to be become such, such a big part of the market. Anybody can do their own homework. You know, what's the default risk in this Fannie Mae bond? What's the default risk in this Idaho bond? Anybody could do their own homework. Uh, but these ratings became so important because of the federal law that if I buy this bond, it has to have one of these ratings. And so that's why it became uh, real important. So the ratings are just like you're going to experience in this class, they're great. Uh, so, and they follow this typical format. Each company does it a little bit different. 
But this, uh, this general format will follow well. The highest rated bond will have what we call a triple A rating. And uh, my definition from these three firms is that there is no default risk. We can't see any likelihood that the company won't pay its debt or miss uh, a bond. And then it goes on down. Over time, companies with a triple B or above rating have been called investment grade bonds. Where did that terminology come from? The law. Uh, the, uh, the regulators of the financial industry decided a long time ago that for a, a pension fund or an insurance company to be safe, they will invest the money only in investment grade bonds. So they have these ratings or not. The, uh, the name for the group below that has varied. My favorite was junk bonds, but uh, that seems to hurt people's feelings these days, so they don't use it anymore. Uh, instead, you often hear it called high yield bonds. Sometimes you'll hear them called speculative bonds. So when we get down into these ratings, double B, B, or triple C, uh, then there is a good likelihood of default. The, the companies that started to use this term speculative were, were arguing that these bonds are as risky as stocks. They're as, as speculative as a stock, as an equity investment. So, right, so that's where. And then if you get all the way down to D rating, uh, that means the company has actually defaulted. They've missed the payment, or, or they they didn't return the principal when they. So the company is at that point probably in bankruptcy uh, by the time they get down to that rate. So that's, that's where the terminology uh, comes from. And uh, it becomes important when we look at bond pricing, which we want to move on to next. But I'll, I'll take any questions you might have at this point. Is there an F rating? I haven't seen one, no. Once you're in D. Who cares, right? <laughs> uh, but there might be, especially since these firms have uh, have been adjusting and kind of changing. They took a bad rap during the crisis, and so they're trying to get better. And uh, and there's more firms coming into the business too. The uh, regulators would like to see more competition, not just these three have all the power. So, so it's coming into play. Is that because some of them downgraded the U.S. debt? And that, it, it, that attracts the regulators' attention too. It, if you downgrade U.S. debt which has almost always been AAA, uh, then you, you get on the bad side uh, of it. So that, that can be true. All right. Dr. Crabb? Please. Um, uh, early on in your uh, lecture, uh, you were talking about the bond market uh, in, in the United States and in uh, the other areas of the country. Are any of the other markets more open than uh, the uh, U.S. market to where there'd be a more free exchange uh, um, uh, than, than in the U.S. Okay, yeah, so the question is whether or not there are other bond markets uh, outside the United States. The United States making up about 30 plus trillion, uh, 35 trillion of an 80 trillion market. Uh, is there a more uh, open or liquid uh, market? And my answer would be no. I'm not familiar with one that is more liquid or uh, than that of the U.S. When it comes to just federal government debt, I would argue that the Japanese debt and the and the German debt, uh, those governments is or are as liquid as the U.S. Treasury. Uh, but as a market in general that would include all the four categories, I would say that the uh, the U.S. market is the most liquid, the most fluid, uh, the most active of, of any market. And that gets to the point I made earlier, which is an important one that when corporations outside of the United States, and we'll talk about this in a later lecture, when they look to debt financing outside the United States, they more often look to bank financing than they do to negotiable uh, bonds and so forth. Uh, they, they tend to keep it more private uh, than we do in the United States. So again, that will come back up. All right, so right now we're looking at the, the bond center. At the, let me turn that on uh, for those of you here. Uh, I want to look at the, uh, 
uh, current market data uh, on bonds. And I'm going to use uh, uh, the Yahoo Finance Bond Center. Uh, there are other data providers uh, that have a lot of bond information. One of the most popular is uh, Bloomberg. Uh, but there, there are lots of places where you can look. Uh, the, the Wall Street Journal site has uh, a lot of bond information. Uh, but I, I use uh, uh, this one uh, just for its ease of use. But I, I want to point out that as, as you're looking into and studying uh, bond data and bond prices, there are other sources uh, that you can look at. All right. So the, the first uh, thing we're looking at right here are the current uh, pricing or quotes of bond yields uh, in the U.S. Treasury bond markets, uh, beginning with short-term U.S. Treasury debt, which we call Treasury bills. That will include the three-month Treasury bill, the six-month Treasury bill, and the one-year Treasury bill. And then what in the Treasury market is called notes, that'll be anything from two to 10 years in uh, maturity length. And then the actual only thing co actually called a bond in the U.S. Treasury market is the 30-year bond uh, that uh, is is issued relatively infrequently uh, compared to the others. Uh, so this uh, first page gives us the current yield to maturity on uh, these securities and uh, what, what that yield was yesterday. So we see in the short term uh, bonds, U.S. Treasury bond market, that there was really no change in, in the prices and yields on those bonds. And there was only a small change from yesterday uh, in uh, the price and yields. Uh, but over the last month, uh, there's been a more substantial change, at least in the longer uh, maturity uh, issues. Uh, so what we want to do is actually uh, use a, uh, a bond uh, from uh, this uh, bond center in price. And what, what I want to do here is apply our time value of money principles to the pricing of bonds. So I'm going to pick an example from the corporate bond market and uh, use that uh, to, to look look at how the, the market is pricing that bond. So that's our second subject here, pricing bonds. So let me go to a bond screener and bring up a bond. Uh, we'll, we'll bring up a, a double-A bond or higher with a Fitch rating. And let's see who we have here. These are all pretty short term. I'm going to go back and do something a little longer term. So we'll do double A or higher with a maturity range of one to two years. All right. So now we have some uh, here. So we've got some government bonds in here, some municipalities, as well as some uh, corporate bonds. And so here's one from Merck and Company. Uh, that uh, matures uh, about one, one year from now, March of next year. So this is a one-year bond. It was issued uh, at face value with a coupon payment of 475 or 4750 per thousand or $4.75 per hundred uh, each issue. Uh, but it's currently selling at a premium, which means that it, its actual yield is going to be pretty low. In fact, based on that price, it's actually a negative yield. Why might someone buy something with a negative yield? Well, they're just parking their cash for one year, and they see this as a, a safe place uh, to do that. So uh, let's try to see that uh, using, uh, the, using our time value of money principles. So we begin with uh, a review of those principles. Specifically, the present value of any asset is equal to the cash flows to that asset for any number of periods, discounted at a risk-adjusted interest rate appropriate for each of those cash flows. And we can have any T number of cash flows to that security. So as we talked about in lecture one, this is uh, this is a series of cash flows, the present value of that asset 
is going to be the, the sum of the discounted cash flows to it. So what are the cash flows to bonds? Well, they come in two parts. We have the coupon payment and the return <coughs> of principal. So in uh, this example uh, from the present value of the Merck bond, i got to go back to All right, the present value of the Merck bond will be the first coupon payment plus the second coupon payment, and then the return of the face value, which we already stated in percent, so 100 of return there. So what's the, what are, and then we'll discount each of those at uh, the appropriate cost of capital. Okay, why two coupon payments? Semi-annual interest payments. Uh, right, it's supposed to be there. Thanks. And I clicked on the wrong one. There we go. All right, coupon payments, and then so we have four seventy-five. But that's stated in annual terms, so we're going to divide that by two. Then we'll have a second payment of 475 divided by two. One plus r to the one. One plus r to the two. Then we have a, a 100 coming back in the second period. Everybody with me? So what is the interest rate that get, is going to give me the current price of that bond? Let's round it a little bit. It says 104.88. Let's call it 105. The interest rate, R, that's going to equate these future cash payments to that price in the market today is what we call the yield to maturity. So notice that the time value of money principles that we discussed in lecture one still hold here. We still have an inverse relationship. The, the price goes up when the yield goes down. It's in the denominator. The price uh, uh, goes, goes up when we have shorter bonds. The length of maturity still matters. Uh, the price goes up when we have higher cash flow payments. Those three principles uh, from time value money still apply here. Okay, let me bring up a spreadsheet and show you those calculations. I did some rounding, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll only be really estimating, uh, but we're going to get uh, to the same uh, purposes. I'll share my screen again. There we go. Okay, so we have two periods ahead of us. In the final second period, we get the return of the principal. And we have two payments of uh, $2.38 roughly each. Okay, we want to find the present value of that. So we divide it by one plus some interest rate, which I'm going to put up here, and we raise it to the power of when it's being received. So if you see there, that's exactly what I just wrote on the board. Dividing the cash flow by one plus the interest rate raised to the period that it's coming into. I'm going to then anchor that spot and put it over. All right. Okay, so if the interest rate was 
every uh, six months semi-annually. The present value of these future cash flows to this Merck bond would add up to 100, or the face value. But that's not the interest rate. The interest rate is lower. Why? Because we know the price is uh, is higher. It's selling for about 105 today. So what we want to see then is an interest rate that gives us the price of 105. That is the bond's yield to maturity. How do you do that? Basically trial and error. Spreadsheets help because uh, the spreadsheets like Excel have something called goal seed. So I can actually set this value, the present value, equal to the price I'm looking for and find the interest rate that gives me that. contain a value. There we go. That should Let's contain a value. What do I do? That seems to be working. I tried it. And there you see that a current that Merck bond has that current negative yield on it. It's selling at such a premium that whoever buys this bond and holds it for the next year doesn't earn any return. So, what GoalSeek, the uh, function that I just used in Excel to demonstrate this, is doing is trial and error. It, keep, it keeps changing this number to get a specified number that I'm trying to show there. So it shows that bonds are inversely related to their yields. It's a key uh, relationship. It comes from our time value money principles. The yield to maturity goes up when the value of bonds fall and vice versa. The yield to maturity goes down when the price of bonds rise. So when people bid up uh, the value of an asset, the return on that is asset declines. All right, let me go back. Questions on that aspect? Very good. So the price of bonds inversely related uh, to uh, their yield or return. So that suggests that bonds have risk. And that's our third key point of the bond market is interest rate risk. Interest rate risk. It's best demonstrated by looking at the relationship between interest rates and uh, their, their, their value or price. If I look at the price of a bond and I compare it to the yield to maturity, I should see a downward sloping line, an inverse relationship. That's the time value of money principle. But I will also see relatively steeper or flatter lines. If I'm looking at a three-year bond, for example, The price of that bond is not going to change all that much when yields in the markets change. Why? Because there's not that much time until maturity. And there's not much more value in it. But if I look at the bond of a similar issuer like the US government, the US Treasury, and I look at a 30-year bond. The actual change of value with just a small change in interest rates can be pretty uh, substantial. 
The longer the maturity, the more risk. Why? The economic concept of opportunity cost is at play here. If I buy a 30-year bond, remember that it's a security, it's a contract with a fixed coupon rate. So it has a fixed payment. The government, the corporation, the municipality, whoever issued it, promised to pay this amount at this on these periods. They don't have to change that promise just because I buy or sell the bond from somebody else. That promise always stays as part of the contract. Therefore, a bond that's issued at a certain interest rate but is a long way from uh, maturity locks that investor into, uh, a, into that rate of return for a longer period of time. Their money is tied up. They're missing out on the opportunity cost. So that creates more interest rate risk. So interest rate risk can be pretty substantial uh, when the bonds get pretty long. Let's try to demonstrate this again. I'll bring up uh, the, the bond rates. bring up uh, the bond rates from the Yahoo Finance again, and we see that uh, they, the fluctuation in interest rates over the last month and week has been stronger for longer term bonds than it has for shorter term bonds. Yeah, because there's more interest rate risk. When interest rate risk, the price of long term bonds changes more so than uh, short term bonds. We can see this on another page of US Treasury bonds and we can see the same pattern in municipals. So you see a higher variation in interest rates for municipals uh, than you do on the long end than you do on the short end. Same pattern, hardly any variation in interest rates on the long end versus uh, the short end. So that's interest rate risk. Let's go back and turn off that sharing. There we go. So, as always, when we, when we identify something, we want to measure it. How do we measure it? The concept in the bond market that measures interest rate risk is called duration. And duration looks at the average maturity of a bond as opposed to just its maturity, a bond's duration. I'll bring out my spreadsheet again here, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll calculate uh, the duration of a, a sample bond. So uh, duration of a bond, I want to make sure I get this formula right. So, takes the relative value of each coupon payment So it takes the present value of all the payments to the bond, including the final payment, the return of principal, and discounts those or compares those to the total present value of the bond itself. So in the denominator here of each of these t uh, values in this equation, we'll have the current price of the bond. In the numerator, we'll have the present value of each coupon payment. And then the final one will be the present value of the cash flow coming to the holder of the bond in the last period. With each one, we're getting a weighted average, if you would, of the payments, or a weighted average of the return of my principal, my cash back. 
So this means that two bonds with the same maturity will actually have different interest rate risks. We can have two bonds. Here we, we talked about two bonds with different maturity. The longer one having the more interest rate risk because of opportunity costs. With duration, we can see that two bonds that have the same maturity will actually have more different risks. The risk will be depend on the size of that coupon. If I have high coupons, then I'm getting more return earlier. If I have low coupons, the, the total return to my, my bond purchase is spread out. So two bonds with similar maturities will have different durations if they have different coupon payments. A, for example, a 3% bond compared to a 9% bond, the 3% bond, even if it has the same maturity as the 9% bond, will have a longer duration. Why? I'm only getting 3% payments back, so I'm only getting a small part of my investment return at a time. Whereas with the 9% bond, I'm getting more cash back sooner. So duration measures the extent of interest rate risk. We know that longer maturity bonds will have more interest rate risk, all else equal, but duration gives us even more uh, information, even when bonds have similar uh, maturities. I'll pause for any questions on that, on duration. So, listen, Gary, did I hear you that the higher the coupon, the shorter the duration, if everything else is equal? You heard me correctly. The higher the coupon payment, the shorter duration. Think of duration again as the average maturity. When am I getting my cash back? If I'm getting a higher coupon, I'm getting my cash back soon. All right. So if you recall, we're looking at the bond market uh, for information. We can get information on yields. We can get information on risk, duration, so forth. We can also get information on expectations for inflation. Expectation for inflation. And that comes from, sorry, this is a fat pen. I'll get a good one. From something called the yield curve. And that's the uh, fourth item in the bond market that we want to talk about today the yield curve. All right, to talk about the yield curve, we first have to talk about inflation. We have to consider what, what an investor in a bond is getting uh, when they get a return. They're getting both a nominal return and a real return. This is based on something called uh, Fisher effect, which is attributed to uh, economist Irving Fisher, early uh, 20th century, first identified this. He uh, postulated that the nominal return on bonds, the nominal interest rate, is made up of two components. When the investor contracts with you to, to get 4.75% interest, like in the Merck example that we just looked at, they're expecting actually two returns. They're expecting some kind of real interest rate return. And then they have, they have some expectation of inflation. As we saw earlier from the uh, Yahoo Finance uh, Bond Center, 30-year U.S. Treasury bonds are currently paying about 3.5%. So Fisher postulated that when an investor accepts that, they buy the 30-year Treasury bond. They've got some expectation of a real return, plus what they think inflation is going to be over that period. What's going to happen to the value of my money over that time? They want to be compensated both for not being able to use their money, that's a real return, and also be compensated for any loss in value. That's their expectation of inflation. So 
What that means then is that nominal interest rates are going to vary over time primarily because people's expectations of inflation change, not because real returns change. Why? What's his theory? What's his reasoning? His reasoning is, is that if real interest rates went up, say in the U.S. Treasury market or in the corporate bond market, then money would leave other markets and go to where that high real return is, at least over time. If real returns were higher in Europe than they are in the United States, then money would leave the United States and go to Europe, at least over time. So Fisher said that if markets are competitive, real returns are going to be relatively stable over time. If they weren't, everybody would be chasing those profit opportunities. Let's take a look and see how right he was, or whether he was right at all. So again, I'll share my screen. Let's see if it does anything crazy here. Uh, let's go here. We begin by looking at uh, this picture of 10-year treasury uh, in the United States going back to the 1960s. So we first see that interest rates change, particularly over the uh, long run. I, I mentioned earlier that U.S. Treasuries are a benchmark interest rate. This is the biggest market. The 10-year U.S. Treasury is the most often one that's quoted as a ben benchmark. So let's look at the history of interest rates. Going back in the 60s, uh, they were uh, roughly around uh, 3 called 4%. In the early 1980s, we see uh, that, or the end of the 1970s, we see they went as high as 15%. Uh, for Why? Inflation. We'll see that again in a moment. Then we see a steady decline since the early 80s to today. Interest rates in the United States, 10-year uh, interest rate, as we saw in the previous table, at around 2, 2.6, 2.7%. That's a historic low. The United States hasn't seen interest rates this low and since uh, after World War II. So real low interest rate. But the picture shows uh, that it jumps around a lot. Fisher argued that it jumped around because of inflation. Let's see if he's right. So this graph looks at the real short-term U.S. Treasury bill and compares it to the annual change in the consumer price index. Is it a perfect relationship? No. No economic theory is, is perfect. But the long-term pattern does hold. The change in the interest rates is primarily due to changes in inflation, not into any real return that investors might be required, uh, might require afford. Then we talked historically interest rates at our at all time low. It's also important to note that they're actually negative in real returns right now. The three month treasury bill, as you saw from the Yahoo Finance Bond Center, is close to zero. Just like that Merck example we just worked through, close to zero percent for one year. But inflation is currently running at above one percent, which investors are getting a negative real return right now. Why would they be willing to do that? Because it's safe. At least my money's safe. It might not be earning anything, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to get it back. That's, uh, that, that's the position of the market today. The, the fear factor is so strong that I'm willing to accept a negative real return with the security that I'll get my money back. Are U.S. government securities risk-free? Well, the rating agencies might think they're not. But if you think about it, the government could always print more money and give it back to you, right? So there is no default risk in U.S. Treasuries. So they are risk-free. All right. If the Fisher effect holds, then, the yield curve tells us something about expected inflation. If the Fisher effect holds, the yield curve shows us inflation. Let's take a look at 
the current U.S. Treasury yield curve. So I'm back here at the Yahoo Finance page. And we see the current U.S. Treasury curve. Real, oh, I'm sorry, very short-term interest rates near zero. When I go out to five years, I get just below 2%. When I go out to uh, three, I'm sorry, 10 years, I get just under 3%. And then the curve flattens out, uh, out to the 30-year U.S. Treasury. The expectations hypothesis which has its basis in Fisher's theory, says that an upward sloping yield curve, like the one we're looking at, implies higher expected inflation in the future. An upward sloping yield curve means higher inflation. Why? Well, these are all U.S. Treasury bonds. The three-year, the five-year, the 10-year, the 30-year, they're all issued by the same entity, the same organization. They all have the same default risk. They all have the, the same risk that I might not get my money back. So in that sense, each bond is a substitute for the other. So why would I choose to hold a short-term one instead of a long-term one? Why would I be unwilling to invest in 30 years, but rather wanting to buy a, a one year or a two year? I must have some inclination as to what interest rates are going to be one year or two year from now. If, because these are substitutes in terms of default risk, if people are paying more for short term US Treasury bonds and therefore getting lower yields than they are paying for long-term bonds, it must be because of that opportunity cost. They don't want to lock up their cash for that long period of time because they think interest rates are going to go up. Why would they go up? As Fisher showed and the data showed, they'll go up because inflation does. Uh, they'll, they'll move with inflation. So, the expectations hypothesis says that an upward sloping yield curve forecasts higher inflation. And it's a pretty good indicator. Uh, you can look up the research studies on this question yourself, but you'll find that in general it's right. A downward sloping yield curve suggests inflation is going to go down and interest rates are going to go down. If you take a look at the yield curve from uh, 2006, you'll see that short term interest rates at that time were higher than long-term interest rates. Did interest rates end up going down? Yes, substantially. They've gone to zero. So is it a perfect indicator? Does it tell us exactly how much inflation is going? No. But again, the market is giving us information which could be useful to corporate financial managers. What should I do with my pricing? What's going to happen to my input costs? Well, the bond market is telling us today that over the next particularly five to 10 years, we could see a fair amount of inflation, higher price. That's what it's showing us today. The other thing that's going on in the market is called the liquidity premium or liquidity preference. And we already talked about this. An upward sloping yield curve reflects a fair amount of risk aversion. People don't want to invest for long term. They want to keep their money liquid. So they're buying short term bonds, pushing up their price, and lowering the yield, as we showed before. So there's a strong liquidity premium uh, in the markets uh, today. So the bond market. The biggest ones in the US. 35 trillion or so of an 80 trillion worldwide market. Within the US, the treasury market is the biggest, becomes the benchmark interest rate. Corporate financial managers have to follow that interest rate. They know, by looking just at this graph that we have up right now, that investors can get risk-free these returns. We better be doing better on our real operations of our business because we're taking risk. So they know that that's a benchmark. Bonds are priced 
as we saw, based on as a percentage of face value. They trade in this market as percent of face. But the same time value money principle still holds. Higher prices mean lower yields. Or when the market is willing to accept lower yields, they bid up the prices, either way you want to look at it. So we saw that relationship in the example of a Merck bond that we priced. We know, though, then, since bonds are changing price, like the price the, this Merck bond changed price, we know then that investors face interest rate risk. There's two sources of that interest rate risk. Longer-term bonds generally have more interest rate risk than short-term bonds, all else each with equal. But higher coupon bonds actually have lower risk because they have a lower duration. So that's just something to important, important to remember when a financial manager is looking at what types of bonds to issue. Then finally, the, the information that the bond market gives us, based on Fisher's theory, is the market's forecast for inflation. That can become a very useful tool when we do capital budgeting, which is the subject of lecture three uh, next week. So that's bond markets and bond valuations. Uh, we'll pause here, take a break, and then I'll come back and do the stock market valuation then. Okay. Great, let's take a break. <laughs>